Hey y'all, welcome back to Shit Your Therapist Won't Tell You. And we're gonna start with a confession. Okay, we've all heard of hoarders, right? But have you heard of trashers? I am a trasher. <laughs> You'll hear more about that in the conversation with our incredible guest, Liz Jenkins, who is the owner of a an organizing company. And it's a lot more than that, which you'll hear about in her bio in a moment and in the conversation. So yeah, I, I talked with her a little bit about my experience with just, I cannot stand when there's stuff around that is superfluous. So it's not quite minimalism. It's just like, anyway, <laughs> we'll save that for the episode. For now, let's talk about what I've been watching, reading, and loving recently. So I have been re-watching slowly the show Greek, which I watched maybe, I don't know, a decade ago. It was on in the early 2000s, and it is, aside from the aspects of it, which like most shows from the early 2000s did not hold up great, is a super fun watch. Kelsey Grammer's daughter, Spencer Grammer, is the lead, and it's just, it's a great cast, it's funny, and it's my newest like thing to have on in the background while I'm working on stuff because there's only so many times I can watch Sex in the City and Gilmore Girls. So I'm really enjoying rewatching Greek. It's really fun. My husband will sometimes come up and it's totally not a show that he would watch, but I'll be like watching it and, and he'll get hooked in <laughs> and he'll be like, well, you can't stop it now. I want to know what's going to happen. I'm like, well, you're going to have to watch Greek. Okay. Reading. I'm reading several books right now as per usual, but the thing I wanted to mention here is that I am reading with Chris the latest episode of episode issue of The Atlantic, which, if you don't know, is a magazine that's been in print for a long, long time since the 1800s. And of course, they have a digital version. I'm going to be real honest here. The Atlantic is one of those things that is <clears throat> aspirational for me. <laughs> like we get it in the mail. I love supporting their journalism. Do I read it? Not really. I read an article online every now and then, but it's been a while since I've like sat with an issue and read even an article. It's embarrassing to say, but true. Like, let's talk about the shit that we don't like to own. And clearly I have not been bothered by that fact enough to like really do something about it yet. And I'm not entirely sure that I'm like gonna make a bold commitment right now, but since we plan on reading this full episode, and I'll tell you why in a second, I called it an episode again, damn it. This full issue, I I mean, why not start a trend? Why not keep it going? Because there is something nice about the containment of a paper magazine. There's, I mean, yes, there's ads, but like in a way less distracting manner than reading stuff online with ads, which by the way, if you like to read articles online, you should know about Instapaper. I know there are similar services, but I just always have really loved Instapaper. You just have a little browser plugin and you just click on it and then it makes that article in this like beautiful, easy to read format without all of the ads and other crap in the way. Anyway, this was not about Instapaper. I digress. <laughs> but this issue, I did it right that time, of The Atlantic is revisiting Reconstruction. And they had Frederick Douglass published an article in the post-Civil War area, era on Reconstruction. And the magazine has published a lot of things about this over the years, including in the last several years, there's been a lot of unrest with the racism and legacy of slavery that is still very present in our country. And in the letter from the editor for this issue, they're also really owning like, yeah, we've also let some people write in this magazine over the years who had some very unsavory things to say. I think Woodrow Wilson was an example of that. Anyway, the there is an entire play written by Anna Devere Smith as part of the issue. And it's just, it feels like a really important issue that I would just like to kind of experience in its entirety, almost like, you know, when a, an, an artist comes out with an album and even though albums are like not a thing anymore, but when an artist you really love comes out with an album, you're like, I, this is an album is the experience. It's not, yeah, one song alone is great, 
but the album is meant to be experienced as a whole. That's kind of how I feel about this issue. So I'm really looking forward to reading it with Chris. We just got it the other day. Okay. And then loving, I am loving a little app called TickTick, not to be confused with TikTok. It is so very useful. And it is essentially a project management, task management, calendar, Pomodoro, habit tracker, all the things, time blocker. It is amazing. And I've used it before on and off. You may have seen a reel that I made recently where I was like shopping around for other programs and then ended up coming back to TikTok and being like, wait a minute, the reason why this has not been so powerful for me is because I'm I wasn't even utilizing like a small fraction of the feature. So I really sat down on my business little staycation retreat with myself this weekend and I set it up in a really robust and doable way where I'm like so freaking excited to go into this next week and be using it as my little co-pilot throughout my week. So I even made a 20 minute video for my team kind of showing them all the features and all of that. And if you're curious to see that, shoot me a DM. I'd be happy to share that with you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm just not gonna put it in the show notes for everyone because it's got a little personal shit in there. And let me tell you without further ado about our guest for today's episode, Liz Jenkins is the owner of A Fresh Space in Nashville, Tennessee, and her team specializes in creating gorgeous and organized spaces since 2005. In addition, they provide move concierge services with decluttering, home styling, and full service unpacking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have to pause because how amazing does that sound when moving is already so freaking stressful? Liz's side hustle is a thriving consulting venture where she helps small business owners streamline their systems and processes so they can be more productive and profitable. You can find more info and organizing tips at afreshspace.com and at afreshspace on Instagram. Let's get into the conversation with Liz Jenkins. Liz, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm excited too. This was something that I've thought about doing for a while. So I'm super happy to be here. Yeah. And uh, warning to listeners, if you normally listen to your podcast around like 1.25 speed, you should just dial it back because you got two fast talkers today. So <laughs> 1.0 will be just fine. <laughs> well, you know, people can hear and listen much faster than they can talk. So that's, it's true. That is true. But it is, I, I noticed that. I don't know if you ever listen to things on, on high speed, but there will be some times where I'm like, whoa, I actually got to slow this person down. <laughs> they, are, they are fast. <laughs> I have a couple of podcasters I listen to. And sometimes I think I just, I need to speed them up because come on. I know. Get yeah, to I, the point. This is like I don't have the two other. hours. Yeah. <laughs> so I am so curious about how you got it because now now you're a business owner, which, you know, give the, the spiel people will have just heard in the intro, but you do organizing, but you're also a leader at this point. You're a business owner. So there's all kinds of different angles that we'll explore within that. But what got you into organizing to begin with? So back in 2005 way before Instagram and Facebook and all of that. Back in 2005, my husband and I had moved here to Franklin, Tennessee, and his family had been here. And so we moved up here and I was kind of, my daughter was three and a half. And I was thinking, what do I want to do? You know, there, I had a lot of natural skills, but I had left, you know, I didn't want to do what I had been doing in the past, which was teaching. And I thought, I don't want to do that again. So I had read a book. I'm a big book person. I, I read a lot. And I read a book by Julie Morgenstern called Organizing from the Inside Out. I still have that copy. I loan it to my team. And it's a classic, but I remember reading this and I looked at my husband and I said, holy something. And you can, can curse. I say that? Yeah. <laughs> holy shit. People do this for a living and they get paid for it. And he looked at me, he goes, you would be so good at that. And I was like, I know. Right. And, <laughs> and I thought, okay, so I'm going to try it. So I found um, the, our professional organization, uh, the National Association of Professional Organizers. So I, I just started doing it. I got a couple of clients. I did a lot of reading and studying. And then it was just me doing it a couple days a week, a few hours a day while my daughter was at Montessori school. 
And I just realized how much I loved it. I loved seeing the change in my clients' lives. It was so personally satisfying. I've always been a pretty organized person, but you know, there's only so much you can do in your own pantry and so many times you can decant your own spices. So <laughs> it's really fun if you can go do it for someone else. And it's not, it wasn't just about that. It was about helping them create change in their own space, which then resulted in this sense of calm and satisfaction and accomplishment because we're working side by side to make this thing happen. And that's what I really loved about it. And so once I did that, you know, at this point we have a lot of people and I, I basically run my team and I manage the projects. I don't actually go out and do the work on site anymore, but I love being able to transfer those skills that I had to my team and seeing them then go out and implement. I realize at this point, I actually love running the business more than I love organizing, but you know, you organize your business and they organize their things and it all gets done, but it's just a different, it's a different place that I'm in now. Yeah. Well, and I love that you mentioned before we press record that you studied psychology and, and it's so evident just in hearing how you're talking about all of this. There are so many layers to this that we'll get into, but it's when I initially think of organizing, if I'm in a dark mood, I go to the dystopian place of like, are you kidding me that we need an entire industry to organize our crap, like our stuff? And so that's true. It's, you know, there's like some truth to that. However, obviously like we're animals and we need stuff to live and the ways in which we relate with that stuff are very deep and can very much impact our quality of life. And then I was also looking at a post on y'all's Instagram feed and there's an organization, you might have to remind me of the name or I'll put it in the show notes, being able or something like that, that, that y'all oh, did able some- voices. It's a pro able bono voices. job recently. Yes, mm -hmm. a pro bono job. And just like, wow, the work that y'all were able to go in and do for this organization, pun mm -hmm. intended, has allows them to fulfill their mission better. Yes. And it's just like, so there's just, there's a lot of, I think, heart in this. Whereas when we just look at the very surface, it's like, oh, how to clean your, how to put your stuff in nice, yes. tidy spots. <laughs> yes. I think there's a lot of, of, I don't want to say misinformation, but I do think that because of social media, you see all the pretty pictures and believe me, we have plenty of pretty pictures. We, that's what people want to see. <laughs> that's what we put out there. But I do try to put, especially on our Instagram, some of the more real spaces that we do. And, and what I find is that sometimes people come to us because of the pretty pictures. Cause they're like, oh, I want that. But what they don't realize that they actually need is people there to facilitate and help actually physically do that work of pulling everything out, laying it out in a way that really makes sense, grouping that like with like, it's just the standard process that we follow, but that doesn't make sense in a lot of people's heads. It's just not a gift that a lot of people have. And so when we go through that process of working through everything with them, the amount of weight that comes off, you can almost see it happening wow. because that physical weight of the, of the stuff that's all around them has caused this emotional weight where when that's all gone, it's just, it frees them up and you can start to see the space that you have. And I find that not recognizing that need to let go of those things, because we are so busy. Our, our world today, everybody's so busy. You've got family, you know, kids and pets and jobs and managing your household and all the things that you do. And if you want to volunteer or have a, an activity or a hobby, any of that. And there's only so much time that you have in the day. And what happens is everybody brings in the stuff. You need food, you need toilet paper, you need, you know, you're like, oh, I saw this pretty thing and I want to bring it into my home. And, and then the problem is, is that those things layer on top of the things that are already there mm -hmm. because- People don't take the time and sometimes they just don't know how, or they don't have the energy. We work with a lot of clients that have health issues or physical issues, or that are just so overloaded with their schedules that nobody really has the time or the energy to go back through and let go of those things and clear them out. So those things come on top of the things that are already there. 
And so when we come in, sometimes it's like an archaeological dig. They're like, oh, I put that in there in 2017. <laughs> and we're, you know, we're pulling it all out. And it's, it's, I know this might sound kind of gross, but it's almost like lancing a wound. Like it mm. just all comes out. And then the emotions come out with it too, because there's guilt and there's shame. And why can't I do this? And, but it's just not a gift that a lot of people have. They, most of our clients are smart, capable, interesting people that just, this isn't what they do. Sure. And when they see it all happen, it all comes out. They're just like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't even know how to do this. And, and we hope that they take that and they can transfer that to do it themselves. And a lot of them do, some of them don't, and they hire us again. And sure. Around. But yeah. yeah, well, and, and it's like, we were saying before that there's so many similarities between like the field of like mental emotional health and mm -hmm. well-being and this sort of organizing of our spaces it's the physical sorry i totally lost my i have like five thoughts while you're talking i was like oh i gotta say this one and then it just jumped out of my head but oh so so it's a specific skill set right and that you know your people either have the sort of a natural gift for and or they've also learned that skill set and just like someone in you know, my line of work, like it's just because I know it doesn't mean I can do it on myself, right? Exactly. I might still need help. So it's just because I might possess some of that knowledge doesn't mean it's easy for me to go into my own house and do this, right? It's actually harder. It's yeah. harder to do your own stuff. Like I, I see this all the time. A lot of our clients, they will go to their friends and family and help them. They can't do their own stuff. An example of that is, I, I'm definitely as far from a stylish person as you can possibly imagine. However, I'm very good at editing. I have a really hard time editing my own clothes. Mm. So I have a friend who's a stylist and she'll come in and I'll, I heard like once every so often, I'm just like, my closet's getting full and I can't let go. And she's like prying pilled sweaters out of my hand. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. but I'm joking, but it's, it's one of those <laughs> things that it's something that's hard for me. And so I had to bring in somebody else to help me with my own stuff. And yeah. I think it's the same in mental health. You might know that you need to stop thinking about this or change this or do this, but it's like, what is that heal or heal thyself? There's like, some, yes, heal thyself. You know what I mean? yep. And you, it's really hard to do your own thing. Yeah. And so even if you're good at doing it for others, it doesn't, not, it doesn't necessarily translate that it'll be, you'll be able to do it for yourself. Right. And it's more than knowledge. All of this is more than just having the knowledge because, you know, just like we can see a bunch of great content from, you know, therapists and coaches on all these skills and concepts like, oh man, that's so true. That's, I love that. That doesn't mean that that is me doing the work, right? I might need someone to you know, stand by me, hold my hand, guide me through the actual work. And just like, it's more than just seeing a TikTok on here's a, you know, great way to organize your pantry. Like, yeah, you might gain the tactical knowledge, but there's probably still that emotional piece that, you know, having support, if you're able to bring in support is great. And even if you're like, why I have this tactical knowledge and why do I keep ending up here with my pantry looking like a freaking wreck? It's like, well, there's, there might be other shit going on. And also we're just very busy, like you said. Well, and it's a process. So to use the pantry as an example, we have a lot of clients with beautiful pantries, sometimes with small pantries, it really doesn't matter. It's all the same process, but you know, you can bring in all kinds of pretty baskets, all kinds of pretty canisters, and it's going to look great. But if you don't have the underlying systems in place, to support the needs of your family and yourself and what you actually do in that pantry. We've had clients that have specialty things that they love to do, or they have piles of kids' snacks or pets, lots of pets that all their stuff needs places. So many times I think people get caught up in what a space is supposed to be that they don't let it serve the needs of what they actually need. Mm. So an example of that might be if you feel that, oh, well, a pantry should just be for food, but you don't actually have a ton of food, but you have a lot of small appliances. Well, those small appliances could be living in there and maybe your food lives elsewhere, or maybe we create a zone for it, or 
maybe you don't think about the fact that you have small children and all their plastic stuff is way up high. They can't help. Maybe that goes down low or maybe their snacks go down low where they can get them. So the systems that are set in place are designed to work for the needs of the people that are using the space. And I think what happens is when people are looking on social media or at the container store, which I love, you know, they're like, oh, that's pretty. I'm going to put all this stuff in there. But if that stuff isn't purposeful and well thought out, it's not going to support the needs of that particular environment. Does that make sense? So much sense. It's like, it's just like how, you know, nothing is one size fits all. I I think about this a lot with like the productivity advice out there. Like, that's great. You know, we all know about blocking and batching and Pomodoro this and like all these things. And, and, you know, wake up at 5am and da, 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 da. Like, but we've got to look at the data right of what actually works for me exactly. and if if whatever i attempt to put into place because this is the thing that is supposed to work is not working i can be curious about why and what you know what's maybe what a better fit for me and my needs and and that's i just love that because organizing i i feel like and just the, you know the aesthetic of the home i think is one of those things that people can just get into a box around like well, this is how it's supposed to look and therefore this is how it should be. But if that doesn't work for their actual lives, it's certainly not going to last and it's not going to serve them as well as it could. I agree. And I I think the same thing too in, in therapy and in lots of other fields is if you get really tied up in the outside social pressures or you get tied up in how you are told or you perceive that you are being told to be, that can really impact. I I think people just freeze up, you know, they don't know what to pick because decision, there's always that, that amazing amount of decision overwhelm when I don't know what to do next and where do I start? And I see that, I see that with our clients all the time of sometimes they just need a jump start. You know, Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of how do they get there? How do they get where they want to go? And sometimes you don't even know where you want to go. I would imagine you run into that in therapy as well. They might have a stated goal, but that may not end up being the real end goal by the time that you're done. Yep. So that's a lot of our job is figuring that out. Yeah. We put the spinach in the smoothie of like, okay, so you're telling me what you want is this. I hear you and we'll get that. But also I think there's some things that you need that we're gonna get sprinkled in there too. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about like over the years when, and of course, again, now you're much more a business owner than an organizer, but organizing is your field and a passion. And so over the years when you've like been in people's homes and been like, oh yeah, I'm a professional organizer. Do they like freeze and are they like, oh my God, please don't look around. (laughs) I always joke about that because I have had that happen. Not so much anymore because I think the organizing industry is becoming more of a status thing than it used to be. When I first started, I would get that like, I'm not a very social person. I'm an introvert. And honestly, if I have to put on pants and leave the house, it better be for something good. (laughs) So, But I do know that when I would run into people, I'd go to a social event or something like that. and, And I would get that. And I mean, I basically would be like, well, if you're not paying me, I'm not looking because we're, and also in our industry, we're not a judgy group as a general, Mm. you know, we're, what I have found in our industry is that the bulk of the people that are in our industry tend to be helpers. We're like the Mr. Rogers of people. Like we are the ones that if you need help, an organizer will help you. We will bend over backwards to do whatever we can to help you solve your problem. We are problem solvers. We are fixers. Just that's kind of our nature. The ones that I don't tend to get along with, I will say, be honest, in my industry are those ones that are, tend to be a little, you have to do it my way kind of thing, because that's mm-hmm. not how I have noticed any way the bulk of us are. Like we have a lot of experience and knowledge and we tend to be fairly opinionated, but we're also very, typically very, we, we operate in a very holistic manner. We yeah. we want people to be happy. We want their lives to be easy and we want things to get done for them. And we just tend to be that way. So if somebody is worried about me judging their pantry, I'm literally not like, unless you ask me for help, 
I, I no, not like you do you I'll do me. And if you want my help, I'm here, but I'm yeah. Gonna... And if, if your pantry works for you the way that it is more power to you. Yeah. But if you want my opinion, I'll be like, you know, if you put this over here and how about a lazy Susan? Yeah. Where did those spices from 1998? <laughs> yes. One thing that I'm really fascinated by, as, as I imagine that another topic that comes up a fair amount is like, oh, what about the hoarders? Right. And it's like this sort of sensationalized thing. Of course, it's on a spectrum and there's going to be the yeah. most extreme sort of like truly clinical cases right. of that. And then there's you know, my husband. <laughs> and mine, you know, who collects lumber. And <laughs> yeah, where it's like, OK, there's not like this isn't pathological. This isn't right. maladaptive or whatever. But like we're very different. But the other sort of archetype other than the, the sort of hoarder archetype that maybe gets discussed less often, though I'm sure you see it, and this is this is my side of the spectrum, is I'm calling it the trasher. You might tell me there's another name for it. But I just get very antsy if there's stuff around that feels like it needs to go away. Like there's, you know, a vegetable that is two days past its prime, like it needs to go. And if there's, you know, any clutter in the, in the, you know, guest bedroom drawers that really does not matter at all because we never use them. But if I know it's in there, it's bothering me and it needs to go. And, you know, again, most of the time it's totally fine. And it just, you know, I'm just, you know, kind of making goodwill runs and stuff. But occasionally it'll kind of like, I'll throw away something that then a few months later, I'm like, yeah, well, probably should have kept that. And and, and so my husband and I have sort of a banter about it. But yeah, that's the side that I feel like doesn't get talked about as much. <laughs> well, and there's a lot to unpack with what you just said. I think we're, we have the same relationship. My husband has a collection of, he likes to build things. So we have a lot of lumber in the garage and in his <laughs> shop and things like that. I am more on your side. I, I do find though that and this is a phrase I had mentioned to you prior when we were talking, but it's the phrase that I, I don't know if I made this up. I, maybe I did. I don't want to poach it from someone else, but I, I really believe that physical clutter causes mental clutter. Mm -hmm. And this is not true for everybody. I have noticed that there are certain of the population that physical clutter does not seem to necessarily impact them. But for a large percentage of the population, primarily women, it does. Mm -hmm. Because every bit of physical clutter is now associated with a task in your mind. And even if you can't see it, you know, it is there and it is a weight and a nudge and a, a, a constant this that that impacts you. And I notice it for myself that when I am tired, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, when I have a lot on my plate, that's when those things tend to bother me more. Because mm -hmm. when I start to feel that I don't have all my structures and maybe there's things that are out there, or when I don't feel like doing the things and I want to procrastinate, boy, that's a great time to clean out the drawer in the guest bedroom. <laughs> right. <laughs> that I can get done. You know, yep. when I'm feeling like I can't get these big things done, but boy, I can get that spice drawer looking awesome. Yeah. So there is that going back to the hoarder situation. We don't actually work with hoarders. That is a whole nother specialty, whole mm -hmm. we, but we do actually end up working with clients who are in situational episodes where yeah. maybe there's a, somebody has passed away, or maybe they've gone through a period of depression and they're coming out of it and they need help. Those are clients that we are more comfortable working with. Those are actually super rewarding, especially when we do the more of the estate cleanouts, when again, someone has passed, gone into assisted living and the people that are now picking up all the pieces are dealt with all kinds of piles. That's a whole different kind of thing. But in the relationship world that you brought up, we run into that so often. I swear, if you had like a match.com for opposite organizing tendency, <laughs> literally, I, I cannot tell you how many couples we work with. One wants everything put away and the other one is like, well, I can't find it if it's put away. And you know, you run into that, like, I don't, I don't personally like a lot of stuff out, but I do have the things out that we use all the time, like the toaster and fruit, but I don't want to have, you know, random stuff on my kitchen Island, you know, like it, 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 I find it stressful and annoying if something sits there for more than a day or two, because it needs to go to its home. 
<laughs> and I don't want to be nagged by it, but it doesn't seem to bother other people in my home. So we have conversations about that, or it goes into the garage, never to be yep. seen again. <laughs> I will literally just sweep through and be like, if you're not going to put it away, I will right. put it somewhere else. My, my family's pretty much gotten with the program on most of it, but it is actually a massive source of conflict that we see with our clients. And if they don't discuss it and come up with a solution, I have seen it cause actual harm to marriages and relationships. And people don't realize that, that that's actually what it is. But I look at it as, and this is my pop psychology, like I'm not, I do not, I'm not a psychologist and I don't play one on TV, <laughs> but what I, what my feeling, my observation is that I think what it comes down to is a level of respect and a willingness to step into it from the other person's shoes and recognize that what you are doing is negatively impacting the emotional state of your partner. And, and this, I, I look at this primarily for when you have people who tend to leave things laying all about, not, and then, and then they won't tidy it up or even attempt to follow any kind of smaller system, like even just put it all in a basket or whatever that might be. And when they refuse, I think that that causes this resentment and frustration. And, and on the flip side of that, the person who wants everything tidy has to recognize that people's personalities are different, especially if you have somebody with ADD yeah. out of sight truly is out of mind. Mm hmm and it doesn't matter how many labels or clear containers like it. So you have to have a balance, but the people that aren't willing to at least meet in the middle somewhere, that's when we really start to see a lot of the marital problems and the problems between um, parents and children, recognizing that just because I like everything tidy and neat doesn't mean that my daughter necessarily functions well in a system that I might put together. Mm -hmm. So for, I actually, it was funny. I had a client, a prospective client I was talking to who had been referred by another client and she was like, okay, I want to surprise my daughter and we're going to do her whole room and it's going to be a surprise. And I was like, oh, I don't think that's a good idea at all. <laughs> I was like, I could just see that causing some real problems if she came home and all of her stuff was gone or put away in a way that didn't make sense to her. Yeah. And I, I really think it would be great if she was part of that process. And she's like, oh, so we had a deeper conversation. She's like, deeper, deeper conversation about it. She goes, oh, that makes so much sense. So now it's going to be a gift surprise. And then we're going to do it with her. Because you don't want to go organizing somebody who's not there or organizing somebody's stuff who doesn't have any input in it. Right, right. I'm way off this topic of conversation, but that's. Well, oh my gosh, but there's so much good stuff there because ultimately, the ways in which we interact with our spaces, our environment, and how we then share those environments with people who might be very different internally than we are and process things differently. It's, it's all relational work, right? Because mm -hmm. we're talking about like boundaries and, and differentiation and the fact that like we can make requests of our partner, but we really can't make demands. And that what I might be telling myself a story that I've asked you to do this a thousand times. And therefore the fact that you're still not doing it means you don't respect me. Isn't even necessarily true. Like you said, whether it's, you know, actual ADHD or personality differences of uh, my level of conscientiousness is way up here. And I would always be aware of someone else's needs around that, but your level of conscientiousness might be three, you know, notches down and, and you're literally just not thinking of it. And so and it's just, a perception, yeah, right. You know, that resentment, it, it, I had to realize with my husband who is a wonderful man, but his ability to put things in my systems just didn't necessarily click. Yeah. And I was perceiving it as you, why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you doing this thing? And it didn't actually impact him at all because it didn't. So we've had to have, and we've been married almost 30 years and we still have conversations about this sometimes yeah. where I had to recognize that it was my own perception of what he's doing. He wasn't doing it to make me mad and he wasn't doing it because he didn't love me or care right. about me he just thinks about his things differently than I do. Yeah. So and that's the problem we get stuck in. To come to. Right. And we, we make meaning out of it that isn't 
you know, often we're kind of <laughs> connecting dots that aren't really there, which, you know, that's, we're, we're problem solvers. And when we apply that internally, we're like, well, this is the only logical explanation is you don't respect me, <laughs> but it's actually not the only logical explanation. And as the Gottmans would say, you know, a lot of the conflict that we experience is that those repeated arguments uh, are ultimately about gridlock issues that we're, we're actually not going to solve this in a traditional sense. The best we might be able to do is attempt to compromise, but really it becomes less about can we perfectly solve this once and for all and more when this comes up, can we honor each other's perspectives? Can we feel seen and understood by each other without it being about, I need to convince you that my perspective is the correct one. And that's, you know, healthy relationship. And of course, that's, I mean, that's going to show up all over the place in yeah. doing the kind of work you do. And you as well. I mean, it, I, there's so much overlap between uh, mental health and the health in a home, the physical stuff and, and what happens in there. So we run into it a lot and it's hard because it can be um, very emotionally draining for our team, but we're not psychologists. And how do you say to your client when you're an organizer, do hey, you have a therapist? <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe that's sort of related to your therapist. therapist. That'd be really helpful. <laughs> but, but I do see, we see so much more in people's homes yeah. and it's, and sometimes it's amazing. And sometimes it's, it's painful. It's just, we're there, we're, we're touching their things. And when I hire new people, I I'm a lot of the things that we talk about are that non-judgment, non-judgmental aspect, you know, it, it's just, it's stuff, but people are attached to it. It's the caring that we bring to it, but also how we see the people because people are not their stuff. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's like profound. And it's like, people are not their stuff. And yet their stuff and how they relate to it will tell you a lot about a person. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Very really fascinating. Oh my gosh. Like you said before, I'm like, I feel like we could talk for days. I am just like, I've never been a big aesthetic kind of home person. And I've never really been, I've been like just, just organized enough that I can feel the, the mental piece. But now I'm like, oh my God, I need to hire an organizer. <laughs> Get in here. <laughs> Everyone needs an organizer. And everyone needs a therapist. That's all yeah. I'm gonna say. Amen. And or a coach. Amazing. Well, before we wrap up and you tell people where they can learn more about you and your business, I have to ask on the record, about your your kitten fostering. It sounds like something oh, yes. you've been doing for a long time. A really long time. Yes, probably pushing 25 years. Wow. I currently foster for Williamson County Animal Center. And when we moved to this house five years ago, I was really lucky to, we have a room that we didn't need. It was the bonus room over the garage. So I converted it into all kittens all the time. And so we, we get kittens. I have five right now that are going to be looking for home soon. I do a lot of I, I don't do um, bottle babies, but I do typically like moms with little tiny ones or when they're just weaned and then I'll get them to be two pounds. Or right now I've got a crew that is big enough to get adopted, but they're a little spicy. So they're not quite sure that people are okay. So I basically go up there and cover myself in cat treats and <laughs> they start getting closer and closer. So now I've got four of the five. One still sits over there kind of staring at me like, yeah, no, thank you but they're all getting closer and closer. So yes, I love it. It is my hobby. It's what I do when any day I just go up there and I sit and I get surrounded by kittens and it's amazing. So I highly recommend fostering whatever. I mean, I, I'm just a big yeah. animal person. So anything to do with animals, it's just my little niche. I, the kittens just make me so happy. And it's just something yes. I love. Oh I love my, my foster people and yeah. It's, it's I don't my... know if you've been to the catio, but until recently, I'm, I'm taking a, a break since I have a lot on my plate also like you, but I was teaching yoga at the catio and that was just such a neat thing because you got like 25, 30 cats of all ages running around during the yoga class. And I would always say to the students like prepare for a, just an infusion of dopamine and oxytocin. And it's just, Dander. <laughs> yes. And dander. <laughs> my kittens have done, they do kitten yoga at Williamson County Animal Center. Yes. So my kittens have done that a couple of times. And I actually just did puppy yoga at Wags and Walks a couple of weeks ago. And 
I was, it was a little bit more intense than I expected at the end. She's like planking and arms. And I was like, I can't do that, but I have a puppy on my lap. So I'm, I'm good. I'm just yeah. gonna a puppy that fell asleep. <laughs> I'll be lap. here. I've never done puppy yoga before. That's great. That's great. Love it. Well, this has been such a joy. Tell the people and it will be in the show notes too, but where they can find you, what to look for all the things. So we are, we're based in Nashville. We work all over the Nashville area. We actually are, have some branches with a smaller teams in Southwest Florida, Scottsdale and Knoxville. So we're at afreshspace.com. The best way to, to look for our work is on Instagram, which is at afreshspace. And we try to put a lot of good content. You were talking about pro bono jobs. We've, we've done quite a few and we are always looking for new nonprofits and I keep a short list. So if there's local nonprofits in Nashville, we typically I try to do like one every few months or if one just happens to come to us, but it's a great way for my team to have some time together, help a group out. We love that. We've done three or four in the last couple of months. And we have another one coming up right before Thanksgiving. We're going to be doing a shower the people. We're going to be organizing their storage area. So those are the kinds of things that we love to do as a team. I don't do a lot of like we're not going rock climbing, but we'll go and organize a, a nonprofit <laughs> and make their lives better. So, uh, but really people can contact us on the web. They can contact us through Instagram and we would love to help anybody. I will say that we don't just do the organizing, but we also do move concierge services. So we do full cool. service, pre-move prep, decluttering, move oversight and full service unpacking. So if anybody's moving he here from out of the area, we can unpack their house in just a couple of days and it's amazing and everything's put away and all the boxes are gone. So that's a huge part of what we do as well. Oh, that's incredible. It's, I, I think one time I was doing a, a workshop on like stress management. And so I was just kind of looking at some random resources and and there was a list of like 10 of the most common stressful events that people experience and moving was one of them. So there's the a way to make one. it less stressful. Yep. People should consider Hire it. Concierge. <laughs> yeah. Well, because moving, it's like people have jobs and family and all the things and moving is like a whole nother job that yeah. you're trying to manage. And it's something that you don't actually know how to do well. This is how people end up with their coffee grounds getting packed in their coffee pots and moving across the country and their trash and lamps that you can't find the shades to. And mm -hmm. just, yeah, so that's, that's why we do that. So Amazing. it's very nice to move. Well, this has been so much fun. Uh, I so feel like to get here. kindred spirits. Thank you so much for being here. And I will be following up about that organizer. We're here for you. <laughs>